So I'll assume that you probably didn't play Returnal and that you probably don't know what a roguelike game is. And I mean, that's fair. I kind of wish I didn't know what a roguelike game was too, because if you try to finish enough of them, you probably will start to see your sanity slip down a fucking drain just like the people who did. Here's a couple of my favorites if you want to get started. Roguelikes are not everyone's cup of tea. Why? Because they, by design, have a high barrier to entry. One does not simply pick up Returnal, The Binding of Isaac, Cult of the Lamb, or Hades and does well at it on their first try. And to an extent, you could say that about every game. You know, it's not like we all made it through God of War or something similar without dying once, but that rule isn't a rule for roguelikes. It's the experience. They encourage perfection and perseverance, and if you do not perform to that standard, you will not succeed. Low health, dying, remarkably difficult and intimidating bosses, RNG, and failure are all expected. To the point where a lot of people just don't like them, and that's fair. Look, I know it's the job of every YouTuber ever to defend one of their favorite game genres and say, hey, if you're not good at this or you don't like it, you're just not playing it right. You're not enjoying the game the way it was meant to be enjoyed. I think it's a skill issue. And to another extent, many people can make that argument for many game genres. Heck, if someone said Elden Ring was trash because it was too hard, you'd probably make that argument too. But I'm not going to do that today, because I think it would be disingenuous. Roguelikes are unnecessarily hard, and that's coming from a guy who enjoys playing roguelikes. You need to die, die, and die again just to get a grip on a game you feel you might never beat. Not to mention, due to the very nature of what a roguelike game is, it is almost required to have 40 wiki tabs open on your second monitor to keep track of all the items, friends, enemies, interactions, biomes, weapons, pickups, buffs, debuffs, sellers, traders, rooms, bosses, lore, variations, etc. that you might discover. Yeah, they can be pretty difficult for pretty much no reason. <laughs> this isn't some grandiose video telling you why the high difficulty makes this game genre actually amazing. In my opinion, you could either take it or leave it and still be left with some great experiences. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that on the default difficulties, Hades and Cult of the Lamb won't give you much trouble at all if you're attentive. The Binding of Isaac and Returnal, on the other hand, are a lot less forgiving. So you might be wondering, what the hell is the point of all this? If I didn't want to go all souls-like on you and tell you why you're actually bad at video games, why make this video at all? Well, it's because I recently completed a game for the first time, Returnal, that completely changed how I view and feel about the roguelike genre, and hell, even video games in general. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that after a single playthrough, Returnal has easily catapulted and cemented its way into my personal top games I've ever played. Right up there with the likes of Black Ops 2, The Last of Us 2, Nier Automata, Persona 5, and a couple others you might be familiar with. You know, I used to make fun of the people back in 2021 who used to literally infest any comment section or subreddit discussing the Game of the Year awards claiming injustice like it was some sort of civil rights movement that Returnal didn't win. I was always like, bro, shut up, we get it, move on. There will be other years and Housemark will make other games. <laughs> like, it's not that big of a deal. But they were always so insistent. <sighs> Actually, Returnal should have won, not It Takes Two. <sighs> Who even knew what that game was before it won the award? And you know, they had a point. I still haven't played It Takes Two, and I bet you guys haven't either, but their arguments always fell on deaf ears because I just trusted the Game of the Year awards to get things right. I trusted that It Takes Two was probably a similar, if not better, experience than Returnal. And then I played Returnal. And yeah, that shit got fucking robbed. <laughs> and now I'm the guy who's like, actually, Returnal should have won, not It Takes Two. But to explain why Returnal had such a profound effect on me and so many others who decided to play it, I guess I should first explain how roguelikes tell their stories. Roguelikes, unlike the many game genres you might be familiar with, are categorized by a few key traits that make them stand out from the crowd, but also makes them very confusing to someone who hasn't ever played them before. 
We've already talked about their generally high difficulty, and I could go on and on about why roguelikes tend to follow this trend, either intentionally or otherwise, but I don't think that's strictly necessary to explain why the genre works, even for someone who might not be as technically inclined. Just know that in general, roguelikes won't hand you any pity wins, you need to put in the time to understand the game before the decisions you make in it start to bear any fruit. Roguelikes are also categorized by their absolutely extravagant boss fights whose designs and sequences usually have an extreme amount of detail put into them. You'll always know you're fighting a boss because they just look so damn cool, and you'll probably have a lot of prior knowledge anyways since you usually don't beat them on the first try. In a roguelike, death isn't actually game over, in fact, it's pretty much expected that you will die multiple times per level before getting enough skill or items to advance. Roguelikes are typically categorized as dungeon crawlers, meaning that you will have a map and on said map there will be an end goal, typically a boss you must beat, but outside of that, how you choose to progress through the level is completely up to you. You can choose to take it slow and explore every possible room and find every item and every buff you can or quote unquote crawl through the dungeon hence the name or you could just full send it straight to the boss if you think you could beat it with less preparation. <laughs> But that's typically where people run into problems and call these games relentlessly difficult because these bosses can be extremely unforgiving and I found that the average gamer isn't all that patient. Worse yet, if you die in these games, while expected, you do not keep any of the progress you've made thus far. You must start all the way from the beginning. Not the beginning of the level you're on, but the beginning of level 1. So that means if you're 2 hours in on the 6th floor of the Binding of Isaac, or the 3rd biome in Returnal, or the 4th zone in Hades and you die, back to the spawn room you go and you don't get to keep any of the items you found on that run. You literally start from the beginning. So you might now be wondering, if every time you die you start over from the beginning, how is progress supposed to be made outside of just being the perfect player or getting lucky? And you have a point. Technically speaking, if you find someone who is very talented at any of these games, it is completely feasible that they could beat the entire thing in just a couple of hours, despite many of these games being rated for over 20. They are very skill dependent in that sense, meaning there is a large range in completion times from gamer to gamer, more so than anything you've likely ever come across. I know people who beat Returnal in 7 hours, and I also know people who haven't beaten it in 70. But in my experience, the developers don't expect you to be a speedrunner or to play perfect. Instead, progress comes through unlocking items in your playthroughs that will make subsequent playthroughs infinitely easier. You might even unlock some permanent upgrades that will persist through playthroughs and give you an insane advantage compared to someone who just started the game. For instance, in Returnal, you will often see these ledges and pools of deadly stuff that you might want to cross to get a really good item in exchange for a significant chunk of health since crossing this lake will rip off your HP like paper. And for the majority of the game, that's a risk assessment the player has to make. You know, is that item worth potentially killing me and will I be able to heal myself before coming across a crazy strong enemy? And you go ahead and make your decision. You don't unlock immunity to hazardous material until you're about 80% done with the game and haphazardly decide to cross one of these lakes in the fifth biome. But the immunity this item grants is a permanent upgrade, meaning all future runs just got about 10 times easier even if you died immediately after picking it up, since you can now effectively collect double the amount of items on the map at the cost of zero health to yourself. And there are tons of examples of upgrades like this that will just make things easier the more and more you play the game and the farther you get. Granted, not all of them are permanent, but they do get added to the random item pool. So if you unlock something non-permanent, say an S tier weapon like the Hollow Seeker for example, you now have a chance to see it appear randomly in the world, compared to starting a fresh save where you pretty much just have your trusty pistol. 
And this logic applies to nearly every unlockable item in the game, some of which have quite frankly broken abilities that could save some terrible runs if you know how to use them. So usually, it would often be in your best interest to keep those 40 chrome tabs open on your phone while you play and search every possible room per level to see if you can get lucky with the game's RNG and get some good items. And you might ask, well, why the 40 chrome tabs? And that's because roguelites typically have ludicrously large item pools that are impossible to memorize, and most in-game descriptions are comically undescriptive and have nothing to do with what you actually just picked up, so Google will be your best friend. This is yet another key aspect of roguelikes that makes them so intriguing to play, and that is each level is procedurally generated to an extent, meaning you won't ever play through the exact same floor twice. Every time you die, the experience changes a bit to accommodate and keep you on your toes. For games like Returnal and Hades, there are a preset number of room designs that could be combined in any which way to make up a particular biome. But, there are so many of these room designs that you wouldn't be faulted for thinking that even the rooms themselves are procedurally generated and not just the paths in which they follow. I actually didn't notice that they weren't until I started doing some research for this video, the more you know. The developers just made so many room templates that it might genuinely be a while before you cycle through all of them. For games like The Binding of Isaac or Cult of the Lamb, however, even the rooms you find yourself coming across are almost entirely procedurally generated, and there's a decent chance that if you see a room once, you won't ever see that exact room again, kind of like discovering a village in Minecraft or something. But it's this randomization in roguelikes that makes starting a new run so much fun, because you never know if you'll get lucky and find the boss super early, find some great items, or just unlock something that'll help you next time around. Every run is unique and could potentially offer you something new to discover. It's that kind of progress that makes you feel like you're never really wasting a moment, like you might feel during some filler stages of other games. Once you get used to them in that sense, they can actually be pretty relaxing to play since you don't need to feel bad about dying. It is a part of the process after all. So one of the biggest concepts that new players have a tough time wrapping their heads around in roguelikes is the concept of high skill, high reward. Roguelikes are notorious for rewarding players who take the time to learn the mechanics of the game and master them and for punishing players who just try to brute force their way to the ending without actually learning how to play the game properly. Like I mentioned earlier, it is technically possible to beat some of these games in a couple of hours even without unlocking some of the best items in the game. But, the games encourage multiple deaths, experimentation, and good execution. And if you're okay with all three of these things, you'll find that you'll probably beat the game faster than someone who is just trying to see the end credits. And the mentality behind this is actually pretty weird when you think about it, because fact of the matter is, roguelikes tend to reward players who aren't struggling and are more likely to take risks and punish those who are oblivious and might actually need the help more. In other words, they don't like it when you get sloppy and they aren't going to let you beat the game off luck alone. It's almost as if, to be good at these games, you need to be skilled, but to be great at them, you need to be skilled and lucky. If you're just lucky, well, you probably won't make it very far. Take health for example. Roguelikes almost always start the player off with minuscule amounts of health, but oftentimes some of the best items in the game are obtained by permanently sacrificing health, as in you can never get it back, something that a bad player would be less likely to do and less likely to overcome if done. But some of the rewards can definitely be worth it to a more skilled player who knows they can keep themselves from getting hit. They also usually put the statistically better weapons and pickups behind very challenging enemy wave rooms which even for a good player can be a risky endeavor. Returnal takes this a step further by only allowing you to increase your maximum health if you are already at full health, so if you are a sloppy player who repeatedly gets hit, you will not be able to increase your maximum health bar as all health pickups just go towards healing the health you previously have lost, but if you are at full health, they go towards slowly increasing the total amount of health you already have. 
it's not dissimilar from a the rich get richer and the poor get poorer sort of situation. I couldn't list off all the mechanics in these games that are purpose built around this style of design, but take my word for it when I say that there are a lot and they're pretty much a staple of roguelikes. Possibly because the developers want to make sure you truly learn to play the game, but when you do, it honestly becomes a million times easier. Because of their objectively fractured design, the way roguelikes tell stories is very different compared to linear and cinematic experiences. Where linear or open world games have you complete missions or quests to progress the story and might show you a cutscene in between, roguelikes have no idea how long it might take you as a player to progress through a certain area since gameplay is so skill dependent. Not to mention, you really have the freedom to just die at any point in time, so developers need to be very particular about when they choose to show you any given cutscene or share story progression with you to make sure the experience doesn't end up a garbled and repetitive mess. How they do this is by sharing the majority of the story indirectly and through lore. No matter which roguelike game you play, you can always be 100% confident that there will be an insane amount of ambient storytelling and that nothing is ever done accidentally. Whether that be discovering audio logs or notes in the randomly generated world of Returnal, meeting very oddly named bosses in The Binding of Isaac, or talking with the locals in Cult of the Lamb, roguelikes typically go the more subtle route when telling a very thought-provoking story. And because of this, it pretty much makes the entire game free real estate when it comes to deciphering the cutscenes you do get. You know, The Binding of Isaac came out in 2011, and people still argue over what the ending of the game actually means. And the same goes for Eternal. At two years old, this game is so beautifully written and its subtleties are so small, you could miss a lot if you're not careful. So it's very easy to walk away from it and take whatever you want with you and have it make sense to some degree. But that doesn't mean your interpretation of the story is actually the correct one. The game is just written so cohesively that all interpretations are somewhat valid. And because of this, nobody actually agrees with what this game is trying to tell us, similar to the other roguelikes. Everybody has a theory, and quite frankly in my opinion everybody is wrong, but that just goes to show how great a job they did with making the gamer think. And if you wanted, I'm sure you could turn over every room, find every audio log, every description, fight every enemy, and analyze all the massive and overtly complex layering of metaphors and allegory that the game has to offer and come up with something pretty concrete. However, not only would that take an obscene amount of gameplay, but is that what the writers really wanted you to do? Or did they want you to just take from it what you needed? And that's kind of why Returnal and other roguelikes are such great games. But I guess it's finally time to explain just a bit further to convince you to dive into the genre if you haven't already. In Returnal, you play as Selene, an astronaut from the distant future who works for not NASA and is tasked with doing something in space that probably doesn't involve getting her into any trouble at all. On her journey, she discovers a mysterious radio signal known as the White Shadow, and though not a part of her original mission, she, against her best judgement, decides to investigate the broadcast. This White Shadow signal originates from the planet Atropos, a world extremely far from Earth and one that Selene is obviously hesitant to approach. Regardless, she takes her ship, named Helios, down into the murky atmosphere of Atropos where a fierce thunderstorm is currently raging. Selene, amongst the stress and multitasking, takes her focus off of the skies for a split second and seemingly gets struck by lightning and Helio sustains critical damage. Obviously, in fear for her life, she rips away at the ship's yoke in an effort to keep it airborne or to buy enough time to come up with a plan B, but for naught as Helios eventually crashes on the surface, leaving Selene no feasible way to return to or communicate with Earth millions of miles away. And thus begins Returnal. A desperate attempt for this brave astronaut to find a way off a planet filled with hostile fauna, acid rain, and a seemingly alien civilization left in ruin by someone or something. The first thing you notice about this game, which is something that sets it apart from other roguelikes, is just how intimidating the atmosphere is. It crawls on your skin and has this way of making you feel uneasy, like a horror game, and that really sets the tone for just how hostile some of the enemies you discover will be. But as Selene navigates through this world, trying to find the white shadow broadcast that led her to crash in the first place, 
she stumbles upon something rather strange. Her own corpse. How could this be? She had never been here before. In fact, she had just crashed hours earlier. She is also herself. Is she not? But that is undeniably a not NASA astronaut. And that is for certain her call sign on the side of its helmet. She even discovers her missing sidearm near the body of said corpse. She thinks, what is going on? And after some time, reluctantly decides to pick up the sidearm and press forward. And it's pretty soon after this that Celine realizes that she is in fact dead, or at least is dying. Because every time the local hostiles do her in, she wakes up in a panic near Helios where she initially crashed. Almost as if her death didn't happen, but she's sure it did. The old corpses of her prior attempts to reach the White Shadow broadcast begin to litter the world, yet she remains. Her consciousness and her memory remains. As far as she is aware, she has no clue how this could be happening. It violates the many bases of the laws of physics and with no mission control to advise her, her only hope is the White Shadow broadcast seemingly coming from the highest peak on planet Atropos. Maybe the White Shadow is causing this cycle? Maybe it was a defense mechanism employed by the nearly extinct Xenotype civilization that once dominated this planet before she came. To her, it's the key to figuring out why this is happening. Despite being in such a preposterous situation, as a trained scout, Celine doesn't initially panic. She analyzes every encounter, every friend, every foe, every death, and every rebirth with calm and deductive reasoning. However, audio logs left near some of her old corpses paint a reality she will have to grapple with for the rest of the game. They echo to her in her own voice. You're stuck here too or chaotically ramble on about the gods of Atropos. Stars under the abyss are siren songs I choose to obey. A gravity that only affects my mind has shifted. Hold fast, my son. And some make almost no sense at all. Everything has gone way too far this time. This is the part where I say I'm sorry. So why don't I feel like I am? I try, but it sounds so hollow. What is this shadow inside of me? I've felt this before. If I name it, will that make it go away? Celine hears all of this and often says to herself, That's not me, is it? But she soon comes to realize that she will only last as long on this planet as her mind allows her to. And without spoiling too much, she comes to question everything itself. The reason I like Returnal is because I never expected a roguelike to have such a compelling narrative. While it leaves much open to interpretation, it without a doubt tells a AAA story, with some insanely unique visuals and boss fights to boot. The narrative is so great and the roguelike cycle is so intimately woven together with the tale itself that you genuinely sometimes forget you're even playing one. That coupled with the fact that the game eventually forces you to question even yourself as the player makes it an absolutely chilling experience that will always have something to offer you whenever you pick up the controller. I don't believe anything in this game was a mistake or could be overlooked, no matter how big or small it might have been. If something looks odd or out of place, that's probably because it is, and that's, for lack of a better term, damn good writing. The kind of story Housemark was trying to tell here only becomes apparent having beat the game. And once you do, you realize how elegant the whole thing actually was and how complex of a human being Celine manages to be. Someone with emotions, fears, regrets, failures, successes, and limits. I literally can't say much more besides play it if you haven't already, and actually Returnal should have won, not like it takes two. Who even knew what that game was before it won the award? So that's pretty much going to do it for the video. Please let me know down below in the comments if you like this one and if you'll be looking to try the roguelike genre now that you have a decent idea what it is. But with that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you did. It's free and it'll totally make my day. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you guys on the flip side. Peace out.